Um, can we do a test? I, I just was, I was asking people before, and how many people, there's an American phrase, snake oil. How many people know what that means? So, snake oil is like what you sell at a medicine show. It's a fake cure. You know, it's like rub this snake oil on your head and your hair will grow back. And so I was thinking as I was listening, data is the new snake oil, right? That might be a good opening. I'm, I'm not going to introduce the panel since we're a little pressed for time. Uh, does that bother you a lot? Good. Um, their names are in the, your agenda here. Uh, let me open with a couple framing remarks. Um, I hope one of the things that people come away with from this conference is that the status quo is over. That just applies in so many areas. Just get used to it. And so you still have people who are defending the status quo, particularly when it comes to the internet. And that, that's touching, you know, but it's, it's over, right? So one of the things we get to talk about tonight is what takes its place. Uh, something that's come up in the earlier panel, which stole some of our thunder. I was a little grumpy about that. Um, we're seeing a reassertion of sovereignty. I mean, it's a reaction, perhaps, to the globalization that followed uh, the last 20 years. Uh, it turns out people don't want to be one world after all. They want to be their own world. Um, so we're seeing a reassertion of sovereignty. but. It won't be the sovereignty we had in the past. How should sovereignty change? Um, we talk about the multi-stakeholder model. Um, who are stakeholders, right? And how do stakeholders get selected? If it's self-selection, I'm a little uncomfortable. But um, why don't I go down the panel and start by saying, you know, we can talk about what's lacking in the current arrangements that are driving change. What drives governments to regulate the internet? Um, how do we secure the public good in cyberspace, assuming that the current model uh, doesn't effectively deliver the, the public good? And I think that's a safe statement. And then are we ready to cooperate across borders? And if we are ready to cooperate across borders, what are we ready to cooperate across borders on? Um, let me start with uh, Gulshan Rai, who's the National Cybersecurity Coordinator of India. Hi down there. You have to leave a bit early, I understand, and so we appreciate your taking the time to even be on the panel. But maybe you could start by talking about where do you think we are, where do you think we need to change, what's driving all this? First of all, I must thank you for adjusting me uh, uh, in, the, in this time. Uh, and uh, thanks for the your nice introduction, what is cap. I will take up what uh, Kovita has said, the keynote speaker has mentioned it. He has put up a nice, sweet, nice slide there where he showed the, how does the, I mean, the virtual world looks like to be there. I will interpret it in a slightly Sorry. different manner <laughs> there. <clears throat> all of, all the countries have certain boundaries, whether you talk about, if you look at the world map, there are uh, countries reflected in a different colors and different boundaries are reflected there. That's a real world, where there is a sovereignty and where there is a, a legal framework, there are different uh, frameworks handling, regulating the society, regulating the industry or what all we talk about it. But if you look at the virtual world, the slide which uh, our friend has put it up, there is no boundaries there. There is absolutely no boundaries. There is no sovereignty aspect there. That's what I interpret in a different manner. That's a virtual world there. Anyone from anywhere can access any resources there. It is true for the legitimate use. It is true for the illegitimate use or the crime or the terrorism what aspects there. Now, that scenario is going to be much more difficult in the technological innovations which are going up down the line. We have only seen the tips of the iceberg when we talk about the artificial intelligence or we talk about the big data and the revolution in the, the communication aspect there. And as we move on, or the IoT, as we move on, that virtual scenario is going to be really very, very complex, very, very complex. Now the question comes up, can we handle those boundaries, the, where the, the world which is virtual and which is you no know, boundaries are there. Whether the rules, policy, regulations are in place, 
But the more question, more diff, but the fundamental question comes to often to my mind, I was discussing today afternoon with my friend. Are we moving in a direction, right direction, or do we have the mindset to deal with such kind of a fluid uh, world which we are going to have it? And again, I was uh, having a discussion with uh, uh, our uh, ambassador from Sweden who was here. When it comes to 5G, 5G technology is going to be altogether different world is than there what we have seen there. Where authentication, authorization, everything is going to be at the BTS level there. Whether that scenario of fluidity in case of 5G, 6G or whatever 7G, we will be able to handle, we will be able to think the virtual world and convert to the real world which are frame blocks and things uh, are there. My answer is that uh, I often say that uh, we are not yet ready. We just, just not understood the issues, what issues we are going to have it. Today, the issue is more important. We all talk about data localization. We talk about the uh, uh, other issues, uh, the privacy framework. Whether the privacy of individual is important or the privacy of the society or the nation is important, which one is more important there? and whether the existing policies or the uh, laws and regulation which we are thinking about it, whether it's talk about the GDPR, we have our own BN Krishna committee report, our framework will come up there, whether we'll be able to answer? Yes, we have also gone on the principle, which, which Kovita has said, that is a usage which should be mandated, it's very difficult to do that. So this issue, whether the privacy of a nation, privacy of a society, or the, what impact the culture of a particular society or a country uh, is going to play a role in the, on, on such issues there. Then you have issue of cyber norms, you have issue of jurisdiction, these issues, and it's better that we need to evolve a uniform framework there, rather than leaving in a boundaries or confined. Uh, because if you leave to the boundaries and confined, we will be uh, not be able to resolve the issues. We will not be able to match the speed with which the innovations are happening or with which the other, uh, the security issues or the privacy issues will happen there. As of today, if you plot innovation versus the security in a, on, a, on, a, uh, on a graph there, you'll find there is almost a 50 degree difference between the security will go like this or the innovations will go like this. We need to have a framework so that we can bridge. I don't think we'll be ever time we'll be in a position to bridge the gap. There will always be different, but our framework or our policies or uh, uh, rules regulation should be to uh, uh, bridge the difference between the two curves as far as possible. And one of the strong way will be in a multi-stakeholder. You talk about the multi-stakeholder. I think the private sector also need to think that they are a important component of the multi-stakeholder group there. And they have to play an equal role at par with the government if we want to really understand and move or they catch the innovations which are taking place. Thank you. Great, thank you. I hope one topic we have time to discuss towards the end of the panel will be <coughs> why data localization is a sure way to impoverish your nation. But uh, maybe we can come back to that. Um, Trolls Jorgensen, um, same question. Where do you think we are? Where do you think we need to go? So um, my speciality is cybersecurity. And I have always to uh, remember that the majority of what is going on on the internet is for the greater good, right? So we do good things, as was said here, you know, more transparency. We might cure cancer and other things. So cybersecurity is not a blocker. It should be an enabler for, for that. But I think that what we are doing um, uh, basically is that we are moving so fast right now that security and regulation can simply not cope. And I don't think that, that we have really considered that to the end. So um, I think that that is a matter of, I, I wish that the world was like Estonia, but I think it's easier to deal with countries with 1.3 million people that are homogeneous and uh, in, in one race, uh, maybe like I'm Danish, so we have more or less the same system as you have. But if you have a look at it globally, I think that in other countries, 
the population might not trust their government, and in some countries the government might not trust their population, and uh, in third countries you, you might not trust big companies and whatever, and because of that lack of trust, we've been in a catch-22, so the innovation is just continuing without any slowdown, and it will, we will go, if I look at, at, uh, at uh, security from bad to worse, I would say with the uh, IoT and with the with the uh, transformation into mobile, we'll have much more users online. So if we don't fix security and to a certain extent also privacy and integrity, then I think that we will see other, maybe more dramatical measures taken into account. Maybe a splinter net where we are making the balkanization of the internet, which will again undermine the whole purpose of the internet, which was to exchange information free and openly in many ways to cure things and to, to get better prosperity and growth and also ease of many things. So, so what I think we, we need is to, to have a dedicated work, and I've seen many um, you know, companies doing that, um, trying to, to find a way of a, an accord, a charter or whatever, but I don't think that, that companies can do that alone and I don't think governments can do that alone either. I think that that needs a platform which is independent, neutral. And that's why I think that the World Economic Forum might be able to offer that platform and again to bring together the, the big businesses that have huge uh, digital assets and those who also drive innovation and uh, then governments and I think also academia. Because we need at a certain extent to have a, a digital Geneva Convention which in one way or another frame that uh, and, and then the only way we can do that, I guess, is, is by taking a selected part of the world out to do that. I'm, I'm a big believer in the UN, but uh, the UN is extremely slow also. And, and, and one thing that you cannot say about cyber is that that's not slow. So if we want to catch up in this, I think we need to do that in a group of the willing countries and those who have an interest in this and with the right companies. And I think we can do that. So, so that was my... Uh, 10 cents on, on the big problem. Great, that was actually more like 15 cents, and you stole Angela's thunder, so. Uh, uh, so what we've heard so far But we then at least can agree that we agree. <laughs> <laughs> Gulshan, we heard uh, the need perhaps to redefine sovereignty, or at least rethink it, how it applies. You were talking about, I'm just summarizing your remarks, redefine, rethink sovereignty, think about data localization, look at the effects of technological change in 5G, um, for trolls, you raise trust, partnership between governments and companies, and what we would call perhaps a like-minded approach. If I was mean, I would ask Angela why Microsoft is the only company putting these ideas forward. But we'll pa pause for a minute and give uh, Gulshan a chance to add something. No, I, you said localization. I did not uh, touch little uh, detail there. But in localization, there are not one aspect of the localization. Mm -hmm. Whether you want to look at it, what I find the debate in India or elsewhere outside, are we talking about, we are largely looking at localization from the commercial aspect there. But mm -hmm. whether, it, in my view, time is there to look at first strategically localization there. By doing the localization, our uh, ICAR is sitting there, are we not going, pushing towards the, the countries, uh, a country-wise internet or that kind of a things there. Mm. So one has to look at more from the point of view of strategic also, apart from commercialization there. Commercialization is something, we can resolve it. But if you are fragmenting the uh, system, mm. then it becomes a very, very diff if different kind of a, uh, a game, different kind of issue, and it goes out of the proportion there. And that is where I see that, I have to clarify that. I think the uh, uh, the private sector has to come forward and really in the, in the governments, like-minded governments will have to come forward and sit together and try to see that we create a single kind of a, a global village rather than putting in a partitions or thinking in terms of boundaries that we should not think about. It's, to, it's, it's a, a call which each one of us will have to take. One Thank of the you. issues that we may have time to come back to is where that global debate should be housed. Most people would say the UN, frankly, but there are issues with pace and with the ability of the UN to reach conclusions. And the Secretary General created this high-level panel. Uh, it's got, what, nine months, six months to come up with a report? Let's see where they end up. Very good staff, but a difficult problem. 
Um, it is a good lead-in in some ways to Angela. I won't ask her why Microsoft has taken the lead in this, uh, this arena, but maybe you can tell us uh, what you're up to, um, where you think we need to go. Uh, thanks, Jim, and, and I, I just thought I'd start by saying thank you to ORF, Samir, and his team for pulling together this great conference. Um, my first time here in India for this particular conference was 2013, and when I look at both the agenda and the speakers and even the discourse that we've had so far, um, the status quo is, is, is not holding, but this particular conference seems to be really pulling together communities to take on the hard challenges, so I'm very honored to be here. Um, a little bit of, of where I think the world is at and then moving into to the Microsoft lens on some of these things. When I looked at and read the premise of this particular panel, um, the word that, that came to my mind was fragmentation. Um, whether we're talking about states asserting authority, um, a regulatory divide in different places, whether you're talking about how countries are improving cybersecurity or what's going on in the international security domain, you're really definitely seeing a lot of fragmentation. Communities that used to work together quite well, the like-minded, mm -hmm don't necessarily always work together in the ways that they used to. And there are a lot of different reasons for this, right? You know, you actually started to hear some of these points come out in what Dr. Rai uh, and Trolls were saying. The pace of change, of innovation, is just so, so quite rapid. And the values and cultures that, that are coming into play when we deal with these sets of issues, whether you're talking about privacy and security, or whether you're talking about the role of government relative to society. You know, trolls started to bring this up. In the United States, people would generally say, I, I don't want to have the government have information. I do trust industry to. That looks different in different places in the world. And fundamentally, I think that the reason that there are challenges is that there are trade-offs. These issues are going to require trade-offs between things that are all, things that are universally important. So when we talk about why we're here, there are trade-offs between innovation, security, the economic drivers, these mm -hmm. cultural norms. Um, but this is a little bit of why I would encourage us to think about at least two or three things. Um, one, in the multi-stakeholder process. There is just storming and norming going on that I think should be expected when you bring different communities together who have divergent interests. It's why you bring them together, because they have to work through the trade-offs. But when you have a bunch of people who have different interests and expertise and equities, it's not going to be an efficient process, and it's not going to be an easy process. I think the reassertion of sovereignty was to be expected. I also think, as Mahima started to bring up on the first panel, that companies are going through this uh, uh, reconciliation of that we do not just have commercial responsibilities, that we also have societal responsibilities. And balancing those two things is very important. And that actually gets to a little bit of, of where we're at from a Microsoft point of view. When it comes to areas for cooperation and collaboration, I think there is a lot of shared interest in terms of how to improve defenses raising the overall uh, resiliency of individual companies and in individual countries. And there's a great space of opportunity and collaboration there. Um, it's not going to be easy, but I think there is room. Um, in the space of international security, when we talk about a peaceful and stable cyberspace, you know, Microsoft has called for historically this Digital Geneva Convention, a recognition that in the long run, we're going to need to have legally binding mechanisms on what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior in cyberspace. Mm. We've also started to evolve that a little bit and talk more and more about digital peace. What is the environment, what are the values that as a global society we are seeking to protect, and how can you drive progress against that? There's a lot of work that we're doing in this space, but the one thing I may leave with before we continue on the panel is a recognition that there needs to be societal engagement in this. 
that this is not just a conversation that governments and industry need to have, and even beyond governments, industry, civil society, is how we actually empower everyday citizens to understand the benefits that technology is bringing to them, understand the risk of those things being uh, subject to cyber attack, and actually saying to industry, governments, and through civil society that something needs to be done. So that's actually one of the other things that we've been moving out with in the context of this work. Great, thank you. Um, I think Ansel, you echoed some points on uh, trust, uh, some of the things that have come up. Um, I would say that the idea of trade-offs is an important one, and uh, the idea of collaboration. These are some common themes. I would say that something I think about a lot these days is uh, there was a book called The uh, uh, Peloponnesian Wars by this guy named Thucydides. And in the Melian dialogue, he wrote, the strong do what they want, and the weak suffer what they must. And I wonder if that isn't the world we're moving into. But that's sort of an ominous backdrop to this discussion. In any case, we'll, hopefully we have plenty of time, so we're going to come back to some of these things. Um, I'm a little less cheer. I'm just not cheery. But our next speaker is uh, Anna Maria Oslo from Tallinn University. Um, what's your take on all this? Because you're sort of a little bit of an of a external observer. You have a little bit of distance here. Uh, yes, it's always great to be the last speaker of the panel because you can always reflect on the great ideas proposed by the previous panelists. So, so my comments uh, will reflect on, on sovereignty, on the role of the states, and in a certain way on fragmentation. So I was just reading um, a very interesting book on internet fragmentation written by Milton Muller, uh, published uh, in uh, to, uh, 2017. And he, here, there his main thesis was that we should not be worried that much about technical fragmentation, but about the fragmentation of legal policy and institutional mechanisms. So we are always used to taking state as the main player. We are always used to having state as the main unit of governance. But things are evolving, sometimes in different ways. And let me bring you an example from my area of expertise, which is uh, transborder access to evidence in the context of international criminal cooperation. So traditionally, if you want to access evidence stored on the territory of another state, you would use mutual legal assistance, a mechanism which is essentially state to state a traditional means for getting the evidence, usually content data, that, then you, that you can then use in court for criminal uh, procedures. But um, a lot has been criticized re regarding MLATs lately, that they're inefficient, that they take too long. A lot has been published by, for example, the Council of Europe, who has written several studies on this and has um, developed ideas on how to take this further. So with MLATs being inefficient as they are, uh, states are looking for other ways to accessing evidence. And you of course need to access evidence quickly like this. Um, usually MLATs can take months, can take six months. Clearly in the context of cybercrime, this is not satisfying the needs of modern, in, uh, modern investigations. So what are the options states are using or have used? For example, there's a state um, in the European Union that has written out very clearly in its domestic law that if nothing else works, it can directly access data stored on the territory of another state without asking the state first, of course. So unilateral access. This uh, state, uh, is also very generous because the provision then continues that it will inform the other state later on about what has happened. Great. So if we put this into the context of sovereignty, I'm not sure it would uh, really make other states very happy. But what if you don't know where the data is? Whether you, you don't know, um, this is what is known, the loss of knowledge of information. You wouldn't even be able to use an MLAT, even if you would want to. What are the options then? United States recently adopted an amendment to the rules of criminal procedure, uh, Rule 41, saying that they can access data directly if the location of the data has been hidden using technological means. An option. 
loss of knowledge of location as an excuse to access data that may be stored extraterritorially, but may be stored domestically. But European Union and also the US have taken this even further. So instead of having this lack of clarity um, regarding unilateral access, you wouldn't know at all what's happening. European Union has initiated lately the e-evidence project. Mm -hmm. Raise of hands who has heard about it? A couple. Right, so um, this is in its essence as with similar straits with the Cloud Act from the US. And um, within the EU context, this means that judicial authorities of the member states have the legal right to request service providers for the data stored by them. But this data does not have to be stored on the territory of that member state or even on the territory of European Union. So this is a shift from MLATs, which were state-to-state -state mechanisms, to contacting ISPs or SPs, service providers, so kind of sidestepping the state taking the other state on whose territory the data is out of this equation. So it's a very, very interesting development. And of course, uh, there are, uh, European Union has, has set a number of uh, safeguards related to data protection, related to safeguards from criminal, criminal procedure frameworks, etc. But it nevertheless raises questions. Great. Um, so, one of the themes that has come up repeatedly is the issue of fragmentation and trust. And one of the other themes that's come up is that we need to do something about fragmentation and the decline of trust. And so I would like to ask the panel, how do we do this? How do we organize? Do we do it with the like-minded? What are like-minded? Um, how do we get companies and governments to work? And Angela said quite correctly, that we also need society to work, but who are the true representatives of society? I was talking to one of Gulshan's counterparts who said, well, for him, the true representatives were parliament. Gulshan, I know you're running short on time, so let me start with you. You've heard a range of problems. How would you help organize? How would you respond? James, let me put a very theoretical question to you as well as the panelist here. It was coming to my mind when uh, she was speaking about it. You have the, our ICANN colleagues and friends are here. You have 13 root servers, which are, majority of them are in USA, and three of them are outside USA. The situation comes up, I'm only saying theoretical. A country like USA says sanctions. Is it pot a possibility they say, you, today they say you cannot use the American financial system when we the sanction there. What stops them or some situation may come up, you can't use the internet sets in USA if I issue the sanction. Mm -hmm. What is the scenario there? You have to think strategically those scenarios also there. I'm mm -hmm. sorry if, uh, I, I mean, but uh, the theoretical possibility is there. Because I have the assets in my control, I can say sanction, and so none of my assets in my territory can say, uh, can connect you or route your uh, communication there. We are leading to that scenario there. So today, there is a digital world, there is an innovation world, and there is a mindset also. I think we need to prepare ourselves on the mindset. That is, today is more important, and then only we can handle our situation there. Okay. If you had a favorite institution, what would it be, or do you think we need a new one? No, I think nature is a little more, uh, uh, is, a, is a more continuous kind of a phenomena. We need to find solution within ourselves, and we are in, we are in a position, we are capable as a, as a society, we are capable of finding the solution there. Only thing I say is that we need the mindset to do that. Hmm. It's okay. today, in my view, is a largely a mindset problem. Mm -hmm. Then your other issues. Okay, great. Do if you, you permit go? me, I would like mm -hmm. to leave because I have to catch a flight. If you if you miss your plane, I want you to blame Samir. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you very much. I apologize for the. <laughs>
<laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Um, I think I'd like to continue on this uh, line of questioning, though, that we do have this perception of the increased risk of fragmentation. I'm not sure that's right, but there's the perception anyhow. And then we have this issue of some of the driver behind fragmentation is the lack of trust, either between citizens and governments, or between citizens and companies, or among countries, among societies. So, um, Trolls, where would you start when you think about, we all agree we need to do something, how would you organize that? What would you see as a way to move ahead? <clears throat> I think that um, in basic terms, if you if we talk about crime and terrorism and all other kinds of evil things, that is not happening on the internet. The, the old way of dealing with that has been based on nation states, right? Because the nation states, they have the territory, there is a perception that the, that the crime and the crime, the criminal perpetrator and the crime scene will be in the same place and that's why we have jurisdiction. But because of the global nature of the internet, this has completely changed. So this mindset is, is to a certain extent outdated. I think that is where data localization comes in because nation states then think we, we can take data back, but mm -hmm. that will then have uh, a negative effect on, on, on the use of the internet. So I, I don't think that's necessarily the way forward. But I think nation states have three normal three ways to influence crime. The first one is prevention. So this is about you know, educating and, and, and whatever, and I don't think we are doing a very good job in, in that. So very, very soon you will see that 4 or 5G will be rolled out all over. Everybody will get a, a mobile phone, even youngsters in Africa and places who are not used to it. We have had the internet for 30 years and we are still getting cheated, right? But now we give the same tools to somebody who hasn't got that background, and that will, of course, give bigger risk. So I think prevention is, is one of the areas that we need to do something. And that can be done in the nation states, basically. So that's the first thing. The second thing nation state can do is protection. They can either protect or it can require protection from the companies. So this is up to the tech companies, right? And other ones that we have the right protection of our tools, but also the governments and the businesses that uses it, they enforces cyber um, you know, hygiene, and, and just like in the real life, if you wash your hands after a toilet, uh, you know, visit, you, you probably will not be sick, and in the same way, if you patch and you update and you do what you should do, I think that we again lift the bar, but, 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 but we don't do that. And then the last thing I, I think is, is prosecution, which is lacking, because we don't prosecute anybody anymore, because the, the, the crime is now all over, and and regardless of how fast we will work in, in, in the MLAT system, it will not be fast enough here to, to catch these criminals. So we need a different system. I welcome very much the e-evidence e uh, legislation. I hope that will come through. And I think that, again, if that could serve as a model, that, that would be good. But on the other side, because of the GDPR, ICANN has closed down who is, right? And, um, mm -hmm. and, and we have a huge need for who is. And uh, otherwise, uh, we are not able to identify perpetrators. So I think what, what we need to do, and um, is that we will probably have to find a coalition of the willing. I'm not sure we can take 190 countries and say, should we have a meeting about increasing this? But a coalition of the willing countries who actually want to do that. I think India would be actually willing to participate that with some other ones. And then based on that, have a fast track to identify, maybe as Angela said, that we, we, we close in on, an, on a convention, right? So at least we have the do's and don'ts and, and good behavior, and then we can take the next step. I don't think that we can avoid at some point to get it codified through the UN, but the work needs to be done faster. And I think that is where I would start by prevention, by protection, and then by prosecuting last and do that, and realize that the rules of the game has changed, right? And you need a different mindset to deal with this crime, whether you like it or not. Otherwise, we will have the splinter net where we have a German internet, a Danish internet, whatever. That's not an internet, right? I, I hope we have time to come back to the issue of what a like-minded group would look like. But let me do a moment of audience participation. How many of you are willing to admit that you like some form of the idea of data localization? Hold up your hand, please. One, that's it? Oh my gosh, two. Three, oh, four, five, six, seven. This is a flawed poll. <laughs> or maybe it's just a minority. Um, we will come back to the theme of data localization because it's tempting as a solution to some of the problems 
that have come up here, but I think all of us up here at least would agree it's not a useful solution. But I, there will be other panels. There will be a panel tomorrow on GDPR where we can talk about this. Angela, do you want to pick up the theme? Do you remember what the theme was? I do. Oh, good. I do. Uh, 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 fragmentation and, tr and issues yes. and trust. Um, so, so maybe three, uh, three thoughts. Um, first of all, I think um, it's, very, it's very natural, particularly when you've been engaged in the policy world, to immediately try and say, which is the right forum to work this in? Right? Like, where is the right place to work this? Is it the UN? Is it, you know, like, um, I will say the same thing that I actually said to someone earlier today. I don't actually think from a Microsoft point of view we want to do choose any particular forum. I do think that there are ways for there to be collaboration um, uh, bilaterally. I believe there's opportunities for multilateral or regional collaboration, and I also think that there is space for international. So instead of saying choose a forum, what I'd actually go to is I think that we need to start with which part of the problem are we trying to work on? Because that actually then can help you get to what forum has the right composition of stakeholders and has the ability or authority to be able to do something. And so one of the things I guess I would encourage everybody in this room and something that we try and do at Microsoft is let's start breaking down the problem space of cybersecurity and international security and start to choose particular problem sets that you can work on within that. So for example, if we wanna talk about how to improve critical infrastructure security, you can actually get a lot of people to agree on how to do that. You don't have to necessarily do that through a UN body. Mm -hmm. You could actually get regional collaboration. There's a lot that's going on there. There's national efforts that can be built on to drive a greater collective action. At the same time, when you want to talk about what's okay or not okay for states to do when they're carrying out offensive behavior, that is going to be a different forum that doesn't necessarily have the same composition of stakeholders. And so I really think we need to start breaking down cybersecurity into the problem areas that we're working on and then think about which forums have the right composition of stakeholders to do it. Just one last piece on the lack of trust. If you start taking a more nuanced approach to these issues, I think where you would get trust being grown is actually delivering some type of demonstrable outcome. I think actually both governments and industry are very hungry for progress. And because sometimes we're engaging in what should we do about this big problem of security, it's hard to see progress. And then you start saying, do I trust the other individual? Are we really doing anything here? If we start to break it down into more manageable chunks, mm -hmm. deliver an outcome, I think yep. you actually grow trust and engender kind of the incentive to return to the table for another turn. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you noticed, but Angela just delivered a, a strong defense for fragmentation, but of policy <laughs> problems, not, not the internet. Correct. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I would, I would have two comments. Uh, first, actually returning to data localization for a bit. Uh, there was a comment before that state are reasserting control over the data. And it has been said uh, by certain players that one reason for data localization laws would be to have more effective criminal cooperation. Uh, but if you start thinking about it, the fact that you uh, oblige the service providers to store data only about your citizens on your territory, given that the crime is transnational, trans, uh, you know, across borders, that it would really not grant you 100% effective criminal cooperation either. Um, secondly, uh, I very much agree to Angela regarding that we have to define what we want to solve. Uh, this morning we had talks uh, between the European Union and Indian delegations and there was an idea proposed on focusing on the 11 norms um, agreed upon during the last um, UNGG report, the one that they... The six, last successful last one. Last successful one from 2015. And I think this is, uh, this is a very good start to build upon what we have achieved, not to forget what we have achieved, despite of, uh, of the last lack of consensus. And I think in that regard, I agree with, uh, with 
having the willing states together, uh, start with a smaller group of states or even bilateral discussions if needed, and then build on these already reached agreements. Great. So I have two more questions, and I think we have time. Uh, let's the first question is, in the past, the traditional way to deliver uh, public goods in this kind of problem has been through regulation, right? And there was a strong desire, in part because of the original culture of the internet, which grew up on the West Coast, where they're all nuts. Um, they're not all nuts, just most of them. Yeah, granola, that's right. So we're moving from the granola internet to one where regulation is no longer a dirty word, certainly in many countries. Um, tell us about your views on regulation. How do we do it? Do we need to do it? Does it need to change? One thing to think about is people always say governments move too slow and blah, blah, blah. What if you used, um, don't scream, machine learning or artificial intelligence to automate regulation? Would that change things? So what if we took speed out of the equation? But why don't you give us some views on the utility of regulation in addressing this new set of problems we have? Now, again, we'll start with uh, trolls. Thank you. Um, I think regulation is needed. Um, I think we need maybe harmonization of regulation mm -hmm. because that is also splintered a lot, right? So, so what you do is that you see that you have 190 different ways of regulating whatever. So when I worked in a bank, I saw that we, we worked in 50 countries and we have 15, 50 different ways of being regulated. So one of the projects we have now in, in, in the cyber center is to see if we can harmonize that in a way to increase actually security and decrease bureaucracy. And I think that is, is, is one of the ways. So, so I think you're right that even though it will be after the incident, regulation is very, very good. Raise the bar, make sure that we have the right and the proper uh, you know, a defense and the right procedures mm. all over because it's about tech, people and procedures, all security basically. So if you, if you hit these three areas, I think it's good. I think also we, you know, I read an article, I think it was Vin Cerf who said that we should stop regulation. Um, I, I think that's impossible. So you can make all the laws that you want, you will not stop regulation. Uh, sorry, uh, innovation, but what I think we might be able to do is to have some kind of a, um, a regulation about, let's say, responsible and ethical innovation. Not so much, mm -hmm. I think we can put that to the startups because they don't care, they, they will just innovate. But those who invest in innovation, uh, in new startups, mm -hmm. they might apply to rules where we will only do that if you live up and innovate according to these standards, which again will help us a bit because I'm already concerned about adversarial AI. Mm -hmm. So one thing is the good use of AI, but unfortunately the criminals are already now developing AI because what do you need to cheat uh, an AI? That's an adversarial AI and they actually invent new types of crime. And I think that is the way that we might be able to, to have a, a, a more tighter grip on that. So regulation is not the silver bullet, but it's part of a mm -hmm. set of things that we need to do. So I think that we should embrace that and then harmonize it a bit. Great. Um, Angela, I know you have views on this. I, don't, I have very few views on anything. Um, so, so a couple of things. Uh, I think you'd be, probably be surprised you have an industry person in the room who says, you know what, regulation is an important tool in the toolkit, and in some spaces it's needed. Um, I think we do have to think about balancing the different policy tools that are available. Sometimes the right kind of tool is incentivizing behavior. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the right kind of tool is, is a market-based dynamics around insurance or liability. And then sometimes regulation is in fact the right answer. And so I guess I would just say, um, let's think about the range of policy tools that are available and make sure that when we do move forward with regulation um, that we think about a couple of things. Um, first of all, you want regulation to be narrowly scoped to the actual problem that you're seeking to solve. Um, I think that that is really, really important when we think about the IT and the innovation environment. Um, second, and this will not surprise anybody, it's got to be risk-based, but I'm going to bring up an example here because people say risk-based and heads all nod up and down and then people move on. Like, what you might want for an IoT device that is your, uh, one of your children's toys in terms of not having a set password mm. is probably going to be pretty different than what you might want for 
um, a car who has a lot of that has a lot of technology in it um, should also look very different than what is helping to manage the electric power grid where there is a systemic aspect to it and so when we talk about risk based you have to think narrowly scope and then based on the risk of that particular item um, from an industry point of view the other thing that we always like to see is that it focuses on outcomes so asking someone more uh, uh, what achievement they should do as opposed to specifying all the how. That sounds like gobbledygook, but think let regulation be a floor, not a ceiling. If you are super prescriptive about the regulation, it will become a ceiling, not a floor. You want to build on top of these things. And then finally, the same point that Trolls made. Ultimately, when we think about the benefits that society, governments, uh, and industry are gaining from digital transformation, if we do not at least seek to harmonize to some degree those regulatory efforts, mm -hmm. um, I fear that the fragmentation that is somewhat natural based on cultural differences will become problematic um, to the level of where we're basically not, you, you basically miss the tipping point of the balance between innovation and security. Great, thank you. Did you want to add something to yeah, that? Just add because Angela mentioned IoT and I think that is uh, a good example for where I think regulation could help a bit because one of the reasons why we have these uh, devastating DDoS attacks right now is because criminals utilize IoT that has the password hard-coded in the firmware, right? So even if you wanted to change it, you can't. So the criminals will know the organization, it's admin, admin, and then they will take the Mirai botnet or, or another botnet and then they will select all your IoT devices, multiply the firepower and hammer out any uh, you know, um, a corporation. And I think that can be done with regulation. Don't sell your cheap IOTs without a password at least in it. That should be different from admin, admin, and that can be changed. So I think that is where it works. Uh, and we could deal with lots of problems with just password in IOTs if they were strong enough, right? So, so, th so that's an area. It's not, a, again, a silver bullet, but it's one of the tools we could use. Mm -hmm. Anna Maria. Yes, and I, I would put an international law twist on, on this regulation. So not talk about domestic reg regulation, but the regulation, if we can call it like this, of state behavior in cyberspace. This is a very important to topic that has been on the agenda of different international platforms for a long time. And yet, this is where we see little progress in regards of understanding, for example, the concept concept of sovereignty and what would be the breach of sovereignty in cyberspace and what would be the consequences of a breach of sovereignty in cyberspace. So when we talk about harmonization, I would completely agree to what you said before, but also to underline that we would need more harmonization of interpretations of these international law concepts mm -hmm. um, on the international platform. And um, in that regard, I think states should be more vocal about how they view these norms and how they interpret them. Okay, great. Let me do a surprise question uh, for the remaining panelists. Um, <laughs> do you want to define what the public good is in cyberspace? What is the public good? Oh, you should have seen the look they gave me. Um, <laughs> So what is public good? I mean, some it used to be public good was untrammeled freedom, or public good was the maximum benefit to companies that had neat technologies. I don't think that works anymore. So what is the, why should we think of public good these days? We've been talking about how you would deliver that public good through regulation, perhaps, in some cases, through harmonization, through some sort of new understanding, perhaps a treaty, you know, perhaps new partnerships, but. What is the goal we seek here when we say public good? That is a very, very interesting question. And I think uh, it depends, again, if I'm Estonian, I'm Danish, or I'm uh, Chinese, or I'm Russian, or I'm American. I think um, you might get a somehow similar answer from the population, I would guess, in, in, in some areas. Mm -hmm. You might get a different answer from governments in, 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 in some of the areas. For me, it is about transparency, growth, prosperity, uh, lots of shared values and, 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 and things like that, but also responsible you know, um, security. Because sometimes we also discuss uh, is uh, security versus privacy. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and where are we? And, and you know, after Snowden, it tends to be that privacy means anonymity. And I'm not sure that's right, that uh, privacy and anonymity is the same. I think privacy is the right that you have that the government can take away from you if you don't apply to a legislation. 
But that's another discussion. So public goods for me is, is um, I will still stick to transparency, openness, prosperity, growth, and sharing, but in a safe and secure way with responsibility, uh, which is not just a, a, a free market where everything is, is, uh, is um, mm. uh, you can do everything. You, there has to be some kind of, re of, of uh, responsibility. Okay, great, thank you. So Jim throws out a softball for the end of the panel. I'm like, bam. Um, uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, a couple of thoughts. So um, when I started and I was talking about this system of trade-offs, it feels to me like uh, balancing and getting to a place of public good is going to be a, a, an equilibrium whereby broad society has the the economic opportunity and prosperity yep. and incl societal inclusion um, and their values protected. Commercial interests have an opportunity to grow and that at the same time, governments can exercise, can and do exercise their responsibilities for national security and public safety. Yep. It feels like finding that equilibrium that is mm. the public good is, is that constant exchange of trade-offs of what that really looks like, meaning mm -hmm. everybody's going to have to trim a little bit, right? And, and I think that it's just we're trying to figure out how to do that. Great. Before we go to Anna Maria, we're entering the question and answer period. Uh, you get to ask the questions, but if you feel a desire to ask a question or if you want to confess that you really do like data localization and we're afraid to hold up your hand, um, please go to the microphones at the side and we'll get to the questions after Anna Maria. Yes, thank you. If there uh, aren't more questions, I have questions, so go okay. ahead. Thank you. Uh, again, uh, much has been said before me, and I must agree that here the cultural background plays a big yeah. role. I'm an Estonian, so for me, public good, uh, in addition to the, the basic concepts that were put forward before, is the everyday use of IT in my everyday life, uh, starting with paying my bills online, filling in my tax, uh, taxes, ref, um, declarations online, starting a company online, checking how my mm. child did in a kindergarten or school, checking her grade for biology using uh, internet. And this being in a secure, transparent way. So I think for me, this is the public good. But of course, I'm biased. And if you can come up with, uh, as if a community can come up with a shared definition of public good, it will make it easier yeah. to both organize efforts and move in the direction you want. So it's a useful question. Um, I've got, we have seven minutes and 27 seconds left. If there are no questions, I'm going to ask one more. Um, we have one over there. You have to stand by the microphone or it doesn't count. Um, so this, I mean, I, I think there's, yeah, I'm Sid. Um, I, to study at Berkeley, I was in San Francisco. I just came back to Delhi. You like granola? Oh, never mind. Go ahead. I'm, Go yeah, ahead. I'm like from the West Coast. I'm crazy. Yeah. Good. Um, so if there's a balance between innovation and uh, <laughs> regulation, let's assume that. Um, what would like right now the balance of power? Who do you think is more dangerous, uh, Mark Zuckerberg or Donald Trump? <laughs> because oh. <laughs> Any any volunteers? <laughs> um, why don't you meet me afterwards? <laughs> yeah. No, it, different roles and different uh, responsibilities. I'd say one of the shocks of the last couple of years is that three years ago the big internet companies felt a certain degree of, uh, you know insulation from being accused of uh, uh, or being dragged into political debates and at least in the US that degree of insulation is gone. I think the same is true in uh, Brussels and it's also true in Beijing. So there's an overlap there in a way between the two individuals but it's it's a very changed world for the the big internet companies. Do we have another question? Please go ahead. Um, so my name is Dida and one of the panelists mentioned that we must start breaking down the problems around technology. But to break down any problem, you must have a school of thought. So because we don't have a school of thought, there's a problem. 
So as we've done for human rights, we've mm. developed a school of thought. Why are we shying away from developing a global school of thought for tech, a minimum core? I'll put in a plug for the, the Global Commission on the Stability of Cyberspace, which is one of the issues under discussion is um, we've seen very significant successes in development and in human rights. Uh, responsibility to protect came out of a commission. And so one of the things we're thinking about is can you develop a principle, a school of thought that would help guide us in cyberspace? But these are very early stages. I'm not speaking for the commission. And if anyone we can, if you have questions, ask Latha later. <laughs> anyone want to touch that one? No, please. Um, um, so I think that there are schools of thoughts emerging, but notice I put a, a, a plural behind each. I think it again kind of goes to the what you see is based on where you stand. Uh, and so you do have different versions of schools of thought coming forward, but I think that they're, they're quite varied. Um, one that I might raise is, is not the answer, but at least one to consider um, is the, the Cybersecurity Tech Accord is a group of companies, I think over 60 at this point, um, uh, who have basically said, mm -hmm. as an industry, we are going to make a series of commitments, basically mm -hmm. four commitments, and, uh, and then actually demonstrate our behavior, uh, how we are working to fulfill those commitments. Um, really thinking about this as a bit of an analog to governments need to have agreements about what's okay and what's not okay, industry does too. And what I appreciate about that particular school of thought is it's, it's fairly simple and it's in very relatable language. It's basically, let's work to improve defense, let's not do offense, let's work with each other to improve security, and let's help enable and empower the global community to do so. So it's kind of four big tenants, yeah. and you could actually see work areas that go underneath those. Again, not necessarily that that's the right one, but what I appreciate about it is it's, it's very relatable and easy to understand, and it's, it's just four things. <laughs> okay, did you wanna? Yes, I would, if I understood your question correctly, then I would bring out as an example of School of Thought European Union, that I think is, has developed a lot during recent years starting from their cybersecurity strategy, uh, defining uh, sets of challenges and moving their onwards with more legally binding instruments. I, I might just add that I think that what Microsoft has done is excellent. Other companies have done something not s similar but in the same area. And if you pull these very good intentions together, you actually get, I would say, a fair yeah. part of the way. And, and I. Actually, I acknowledge Microsoft for doing that great work. I also think the European Union has, has a mm -hmm. good work. But, but, but what I think we, we need to, in order to make sure that we are all satisfied, is that it's not just companies. It also requires governments. It's not just the EU. It's global. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, otherwise it will be fragmented. We will only then have 500 million people out of the 7.5 billion that we have online. So I think that the school should be that we can use this as maybe starting points that discussion points and then we can hopefully in the end come up with a set of principles that are universal and will cover both the European Union and the rest of the world, Microsoft, but also the rest of the companies that feel some kind of responsibility. People will still violate these rules, but at least we can call them out. It appears that we have three or four questions in a very small amount of time. Let's have each of the questioners ask their question and then we'll try and cook up some response to all of them. So if we start over there, if yeah. you could identify yourself behind, we'll go one, two, three, four. Yeah. Uh, okay, um, just wanted to add on to what um, Mr. Horenson said about um, Internet of Things, security and privacy. So I just want to say the S in IoT stands for security and the P in IoT stands for security. Thank you. Next. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jim. Um, I'd love if we could unpack one of your questions a little bit more um, with respect to what would the like-minded look like. I can introduce you if you don't want to introduce yourself. Oh, sorry, yourself. Katrina Heinel, I'm sorry. Sure. <laughs> uh, Katrina Heinel, um, uh, I'm based with um, Exadec and I'm back in Ireland, I was in Singapore. Um, uh, I'm curious, Jim, you mentioned what would the like-minded look like and I'm 
the way I'd like to break that down or ask the panellists to, to consider is the like-minded nations, which has um, the label sometimes brings a bit of baggage with it um, throughout the rest of the world, vis-a-vis -vis like minded interests. And so Trolls mentioned this concept of the coalition of the willing mm -hmm. and whether that would perhaps um, uh, break down into particular um, interests or ex issues in the field of cyber. So I'd love if we could look at those issues a little more closely. Good question. The two on the other side, please. Uh, hello, I'm Reena here, uh, uh, university student, University of Delhi. So my question is that the way we had, when we were having World War and Cold War and everything, we had international institutions coming up. And for trade wars, we had WTO. But now we are having this problem and we are talking about coalition of willing. Why can't we have international institution for cyber security and cyberspace? Because that will be a space where uh, maybe artificial intelligence can also be a stakeholder and companies and think tanks and everyone and sitting together on a board and talking about these problems and then having a coalition of willing sort of thing. So how do we do, do we think about international institution on this matter? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. You were reading my mind because that was going to be my last question if we hadn't run out of time. But we'll take this one and then try and hit them all. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. My name is Ken Koyanagi. I'm a Japanese journalist working for Nikkei Asian Review. Mm -hmm. I think this question is to uh, Anna. Um, uh -oh. Do you have a specific proposals of action to establish effective jurisdiction over cyberspace by nation states or something else for law enforcement? Okay. Let's uh, take all the questions and give each panelist a very short amount of time to respond to them. So, Anna, do you want to start first? Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much for the question. I think I'll take the last one uh, at, since it was directed to me. Uh, so, as it, as it goes, it is not a problem of finding what country would have jurisdiction upon a certain cybercrime case. We have different rules for jurisdictions and, and it's not a problem of lacking that jurisdiction. What in the essence of the problem is, is actually collecting the evidence, international cooperation between not only different states but also including private sector, getting the evidence and leading this investigation towards a successful prosecution that was mentioned before. So it is, again, it's not a problem of finding a legal basis for a jurisdiction that uh, would be the basis for us going to court, but rather having the evidence, the attribution, etc., cetera, to, to lead into a successful prosecution. The reality is cooperation is almost impossible to gain in this international society. Um, well, I'm afraid it's, n it's not, that, not that dim. I would be more optimistic. Look at the UN Security Council. But the UN Security Council has very little to do with criminal investigations. So uh, we do, do have uh, success stories of, uh, of big botnets being taken down thanks to international cooperation, etc. So of course you are right. It is a very challenging topic. But I wouldn't say that it's you know, completely useless. Uh, Angela, did you have a favorite question? Um, I, I'll do a combo of, of the like-minded look like and is an organization needed. Um, because I think they're, they're related. Um, I do see institutional gaps um, in the space of cybersecurity, but I will challenge myself, just like I did to y'all, that I think we have to break down which part of the problem we are looking at. I don't believe that it would be beneficial to stand up a new uh, UN organization, the International Institution for Cybersecurity. I think that that would have a lot of different challenges in it. Um, um, what I do think would be beneficial though is thinking about how you bring together different parts of the multi-stakeholder community to work on very much more specific problems and whether or not you need to nest that with existing institutions or actually have it be independent. And so I think there are institutional gaps. I would challenge us to think about much more specifically what those are and then what the right composition of stakeholders to address them would be. I think this ties though to um, the question about what the like-minded look like. Um, I think that you will start to see and you have start to, started to see 
um, areas of converging interest and diverging interest in the world, but I would challenge us all to say it's not just what the like-minded countries should be, but also what the like-minded communities of stakeholders are. And so maybe moving beyond just this kind of binary like-minded and not like-minded and state-based only into a more multi-stakeholder composition that, that starts to come together on particular issue, issues of interest and maybe divergent in other areas. It's a much more dynamic model that I'm thinking in my head than what I think is generally postulated. So, Trolls, with the realization mm -hmm. that we stand between them and dinner, uh, yeah. a question I'll, I'll, I'll try to do it very, very short. Good. Um, I'll be a bit more bold. I think that um, the reason why we cannot cooperate on fighting crime in the cyberspace is because there is a lack of trust between nation states. That's evident. So at least my cyber center has decided to take away nation state activities. Nation states will spy on each other. They've always done so before the internet, during the internet, and probably after the internet. That is a blocker for any corporation. If we focus on crime, for profit or whatever, terrorism, then I think we have much more like-minded companies and state. So we are at least inviting Russia, US, China, India, Singapore, and other countries to be amongst the burning platform. I think we need them on board because we have a very good uh, law enforcement corporation in the JCAD in Europol, but that's only with the Western countries. And you cannot fight cybercrime without having the other ones on, on board. So we will say that the like-minded in this, if you take away state-sponsored crime, is everybody that has a willingness to step up. And I think both the Russian government, the Chinese government, the American government actually cares about their citizens, normal citizens, that they can do internet business without being a victim of crime. And that should be the starting point. Okay. Well, I'd probably agree with you on two out of three. Let me thank ORF for hosting this conference, which is always valuable. Um, I look forward to the rest of it. So please join me in thanking our panel. Thank you, Jay.